Thank you, everyone, for standing by. Now guests are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's event. At that time, you may press star 1 on your touchtone phone if you would care to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And now I'd like to turn it over to your host, Mr. Josh Finch. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Thank you, and welcome to everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's media teleconference to provide a status update on the first astronaut flight test of the Boeing CST-100 Starliner to the International Space Station as a part of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. I'm Josh Finch with NASA's Office of Communications. Leadership joining us to talk about NASA's Boeing Crew Flight Test, we have Steve Stitch, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program, Jeff Aaron, Manager, Systems Engineering and Immigration Office for NASA's International Space Station Program, and Mark Mathie, Vice President and Program Manager, CST-100 Starliner. And that's for Boeing. We'll begin with opening comments from each of our speakers and then turn it over to questions. And first, we'll turn it over to Steve Stitch. Uh, thank you, Josh, and, and thanks to uh, everyone who joined today to discuss the progress toward NASA's uh, Boeing crewed flight test. Uh, we're excited to be here and to talk a little bit about that mission today ahead of uh, the Crew-6 activities. We don't have any big announcements, but we thought we would share the progress and uh, what the team has been working on and, and what we can expect over the next month or so. Uh, we're all very excited. Uh, to bring the Starliner capability online to have uh, a, another crew transportation system uh, for one of only two certified transportation systems and human-rated systems for the space station. So it's an exciting time for us, and I know the crew is very excited about that as well. Uh, we are taking our time and being very diligent as we work through the final preparation of the flight hardware, the flight software, the crew training, and closing out all of the certification products that we need to human rate the Starliner for flight. Um, as you know, it's a really busy time uh, this year at the space station. Um, the first big activity that we have is the Crew-6 mission coming up, and that is still on track for no earlier than February the 26th launch at 2.07 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, that vehicle has been loaded with a propellant. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft has, and it'll head up to the launch pad uh, on Saturday to go mate with the Falcon 9 rocket. And then, of course, we'll have our flight readiness review uh, on Tuesday, the 21st of February, and we'll have an opportunity to talk to, to you about anything that you have questions about for the Crew-6 and Crew-5 return at, at that time. Uh, getting back to the busy time frame we're looking at, you know, after Crew-6, uh, we have a, a SpaceX uh, 27 cargo mission that's very important to us. That'll launch uh, on uh, March the 10th and dock uh, a couple of days later. And, and then uh, and that vehicle will stay there docked to the space station to, to move supplies and cargo over until about uh, the, the early to mid-April time frame. And, and so when we look at the CFT mission, just from the station manifest perspective, the, the window for CFT is it's kind of the middle of April to the end of April, and that's kind of what we're looking at. And we'll work, Mark will talk a little bit more about uh, the other work on the vehicle and how we will make the decision to target the final launch date. Uh, we're, again, we're taking our time with this flight. We're stepping through it methodically, just like we did our first uh, demonstration mission for the, the Dragon spacecraft, Demo-2. We had a lot of validation and certification work that was actually being worked on in this very same time frame for that flight, so I would say when I compare uh, Starliner to Dragon, it's, it's really no different. Uh, NASA and Boeing are working together to close out all that certification and analysis work, and really this is the final piece to say that the vehicle is, is ready to go fly the missions and become human rated uh, for that mission. So that's the big activity that's ongoing right now. Uh, we're about 80%, I would say, through that work, um, and we have some of the final work to close out and the final analysis. Um, and we'll continue to, to work through that, and then uh, we'll, uh, Mark will talk more about it. But the, the really the next big event with uh, Starliner on the vehicle is loading propellant in the service module. And if you remember, we have kind of a 60-day window we want to go launch within once we load that propellant. And so we'll have a decision in early March uh, relative to when to target loading the vehicle and then, and then how we proceed toward launch. Uh, we will go ahead and give you another update uh, after we get through the 
crew five and crew six handover in the March time frame, we'll, we'll have a, a, an event like this, and we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit more about the progress. Um, you know, I've had a chance to talk to the crew. The crew is very excited, Butch and Sonny, about flying uh, this mission. Uh, they'll go down uh, to the C-3PF next week and begin to look at some of the cargo for the vehicle and how the cargo gets stowed and begin to prepare as part of the normal preparation uh, for launch. And they are in the middle of many simulations. Uh, there was a mission dress rehearsal uh, for launch not too long ago and then another one from the undock to landing that had transpired. Um, the Crew-6 astronauts are really excited, uh, talking to Steve Bowen and his crew about having uh, Starliner there during his increment. When I talked to them uh, a week or so ago, I told them that I was very confident the vehicle would be there, and, and they're very excited about that. Uh, before I hand over to Jeff Aaron, I just want to say I'm very proud of the NASA and Boeing team uh, and the whole CCP family. We're working through a really busy time frame, and people are working very hard, and we'll go fly Starliner when we're ready. and take it one step at a time, and I'll turn it over to Jeff Aaron. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, again, welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, from an ISS point of view, uh, we're super excited um, to see Butch and Sonny uh, show up uh, on, Starline, on Starliner for, for their eight-day mission. Um, both Sonny and, and uh, Butch bring a wealth of experience in their careers and will complement the crew on board station brilliant, brilliantly. Uh, during their time on station, they will be busy, be busy conducting science, technology, uh, demonstrations, outreach, and, and commercial activities. Um, and it's kind of a, just a big deal for us because we go from seven crew to nine crew, and it's just uh, just having more hands on on, on board uh, really helps us complete complete our mission. Um, in terms of criticality, this mission is super important from a certification certification process for Starliner for rotational flights to and from the International Space Station, so we're really looking forward to it. Um, so it's been a busy week on board. I think you, you're probably aware of um, a couple things that have been going on. Um, I'll briefly talk about those, but I just, I'd like to focus today's telecon on Boeing and the upcoming CFT mission. Um, but as you probably know, on Saturday uh, of this week, um, shortly after actually the, uh, the 83 progress docked, literally about an hour and a half later, um, the Russian MCC folks recorded a depressurization in the unpiloted Roscosmos Progress 82P cargo ship's coolant loop, which is docked to uh, our Zenith port, our Poisk module uh, on station. Uh, just a reminder that the 82P Progress showed up in October of last year, so it's been on board for about four months. The reason for the coolant leak is continue to be in, continuing to be investigated um, between our NASA specialists and Roscosmos counterparts. Um, an inspection was completed earlier this week using the Canada Arm 2 to gather imagery of the suspected area, and the teams are evaluating that imagery. Um, we actually just polled GO uh, this morning at the uh, IMMT, the International Space Station Mission Management Team, to have that progress undock later this evening, 8.26 p.m. Houston time. Uh, following the undocking, the Expedition 68 cosmonauts will send commands to the progress to rotate about 180 degrees so that we can get additional visual inspections and documentation of the general area where the coolant leak occurred. Um, about one rev later, excuse me, one, one orbit later, the progress will execute its deorbit burn and perform a controlled reentry over the Pacific Ocean. Um, the, the entire NASA and Roscosmo team have continued to work together to investigate the cause of this situation, and we will continue to do so. Um, so we'll know more in the coming days, uh, and we have a Crew-6 post-FR telecon on Tuesday next week, and uh, then we can discuss this further if, if need be. But today, I, again, I'd like to focus on Boeing and CFT mission. Um, on other things going on, just kind of moving on ahead, uh, the International Space Station is excited. The whole team's excited to uh, support the upcoming upcoming crew mission. Crew six will spend approximately six months on station and will complete hundreds of important science investigations during their mission. Um, the crew six vehicle will, will will conduct a typical handover with the crew five vehicle. Uh, 
following launch, launch and dock. Uh, beyond Cruise 6, come in the spring, we're, we're excited about the Axiom 2 launching later, uh, and it will, it will welcome four private astronauts to space station for a 10-day mission, and uh, this will be, as, as it says, there our second private astronaut mission to ISS, so uh, again, a very exciting, exciting time. So looking forward to seeing another truly international crew, crew collaborating and completing a mission together aboard, aboard the International Space Station. Thank you very much. With that, I should hand over to Mark. All right. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for participating in this morning's event. Uh, to recap a little bit where we came from and what, you know, how we got to where we are today. I remember we flew OFT2 in the May timeframe last year, came back from that mission with uh, a, a really a very successful mission, but we still had some lessons that we learned and we had to put our plans together for certification. So we took the summer to understand all that in about the October timeframe. We established an April target for the CFT mission based on, on the work that was ahead of us, the hardware issues that we had encountered, and then the, uh, the, the engineering products that needed to be completed. So we're still planning. Uh, we're still ma we've maintained that plan, I should say, and we're still targeting that mid-April to late April timeframe. So I think that's a real credit to the NASA and the Boeing team that you know we got together, we put together a pretty good plan, and we're still executing to it. But now we uh, we look at basically five different areas to judge our progress and and measure ourselves. And you know, we put them on a schedule and we call them swim lanes. So I kind of refer to them as five different swim lanes. The first two are the hardware that you know it takes to uh, to fly the vehicle, and that's the service module and the crew module. And I'll talk a little bit about where we stand with that. The, the third area is the flight software and getting that. Uh, to the right revision and incorporating all of the lessons learned from previous experiences. The fourth area is the mission operations planning and training. And then the last area is the engineering products. And we split the engineering products into two kind of sub areas. That's the design products, the, the, the things that Steve talked about, the verifications and the hazard reports. And then there are technical issue resolution from, from the previous flight uh, IFAs and and the hardware anomalies that we uh, encountered through the processing of the vehicle. So I'll talk e about each one of these in a little bit of detail and tell you where we are with respect to each one of those swim lanes. On the hardware, uh, the hardware is, is uh, stacked. It's been mated. It's in what we call the uh, hazardous processing area. We're doing final integrated testing there. As Steve mentioned, the crew will be down next week and we'll be doing our crew interface test. We're gonna do that in two parts. The first part will be next week and then after the cargo's loaded, we'll, fit, we'll do the second part at the beginning of March. Uh, the, the additional step beyond that, which is a real big milestone for us, is to get the loading of propellants done. Uh, like Steve said, we'll, we'll meet on that and we'll determine you know, our line of sight of uh, how the products are coming together and when we think our launch date is gonna look, and that's also based on some of the ISS traffic. And we'll, set, we'll, uh, we'll determine whether or not we wanna load simulations, operational failure scenarios uh, with the crew and other sims. All that work is, not all of it, but most of that work is all behind us. It's been very successful. And uh, we've got a line of sight to get to uh, the mission time frame and get through all of our reviews, and the flight software is looking really good. On the mission operations side, uh, training procedures and all the crew activities are ongoing. They're all on plan, and, of course, those will continue throughout the next several weeks as uh, just normal L-day minus uh, day kind of activities. And the engineering products is really our critical path, as Steve talked. Uh, the design products, um, we're in the final phases of reviews with NASA. So there's, at this point, uh, we have a lot of the products, or most of the products, if not all the products, are turned over to NASA. And we're in what we'll call a review cycle, where they'll have questions for us, and we'll go back and forth and make sure that 
uh, we're answering all their questions, and if there's something that we're missing, we'll, we'll make sure we add those back to the packages. So that's an iterative process that will happen over the next several weeks. But it's it's important to remember that this is, like Steve said, the final stage. You know, we've we've done our designs, we've we've tested this hardware, uh, the analysis is all all done. So now this is the kind of let's wrap it all up in a bow and make sure that we we did what we said we were going to do, and we have all the artifacts to prove it. And that's what we're going through at this time. So Steve and I are watching this real closely, and we'll track our, our readiness as we go forward. On the technical side, you know, with the technical issues, all of our IFAs have closure dates. Um, we're working to those. Our, they have resolution paths. Uh, there's a couple of areas where we, we have maybe two paths, and we're, we're deciding with NASA which one we want to choose. But uh, we have a, a dates for all of these to close and get discussed, and, and they fit with, uh, with our current plans. So all these swim lanes are coming together. Uh, this all leads to us being able to get together and, and decide you know, when our exact launch date is going to be. And like Steve said, that's going to be at the beginning of March timeframe. Uh, while we've been doing all this work, the crew office, and Sonny and Butch have been personally involved and engaged in our technical discussions, obviously our training events and some of our testing. Uh, so, you know, we have stayed very close together. Uh, they, they feel we've had a good conversations with them. I think they, they feel very comfortable with our hardware and our, uh, our processes going forward. So we're looking forward to continuing those, uh, those simulations and those training events and that dialogue until we get to launch day. At the same time, we've been working toward our PCM-1 mission. So we take those same five swim lanes and we, we meet, on, meet on them every week to make sure that we're making the progress that we need to, in order to be ready for that crew rotation in the winter of 24. Uh, we're working some new parachute designs uh, to improve the vehicle. Uh, there's crew module battery um, mitigation steps that we're doing to, uh, to for longer duration missions to improve our performance there. So those are just some of the areas that we're working on for PCM that we already know we, we want to put in place. Uh, we're also incorporating a dual port capability so that we can dock on the International Space, Space Station at both docking ports. And that's going to, that's uh, on plan and that's a, a, a big change uh, from CFT, uh, it's going to require or is requiring some flight software, GNC, and some mission ops changes, and we've got a good plan, and, and we're marching down that schedule to be ready for PCM. So we're excited about the, the CFT mission. Um, we have some incremental decision points like we've talked about ahead of us based on the ISS availability and, and the work that we have uh, uh, going forward. Uh, so we'll, we'll – uh, We'll continue down that path, and like Steve said, we're we're going to take it very slowly and and make sure that we uh, address everything that needs to be addressed. So it's back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Mark, and to all of our opening comments. We'll now turn it over to the question and answer portion. As a reminder, to get into the question queue, please press star one on your phone. And our first question today will be from Joey Roulette at Reuters. Hey, thanks, Josh. Um, question for, I guess, anyone who can answer. Uh, with all the stuff that you guys have to review before uh, flight and with the complications now going on with progress and, and you know, the investigation with Russia's space agency, um, I'm just kind of curious how you can still expect a launch date sometime in the month after next month in, in April. If you could kind of go into that, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, Joey, why don't I? I'll, I'll start, and then uh, and I'll see if Mark has anything to add. Um, yeah, what, what we're in the middle of doing right now is uh, the first thing I'll talk about is is the compl complexity of the manifest. Um, right now, the uh, Crew Five vehicle um, Dragon is docked at the Ford port, and so uh, with a successful launch of Crew Six and then a handover. Uh, we would undock um, Crew 5 around March uh, 5th, and then that clears that port uh, for the, the cargo mission. And that cargo mission would dock around the 12th or so, and then undock around the 11th. And so there, there's a swim lane that we're going to watch very carefully relative to 
the traffic, right? Because the CFT vehicle, just like uh, for Demo 2, can only dock to the forward port. And so we'll have to watch weather delays and things like that to see where we end up relative to having a, a window to go launch CFT. And so we'll, we'll follow that very closely. Uh, we're working hand in hand with the ISS program relative to uh, to the Soyuz operations and the Soyuz launch, and then relative to the CERT products, we have our team, as Mark said, working uh, together to go review those those final sets of products, and uh, we have most of them in hand, and we're working through those. And some of them we've had early drafts, and some of them we have had independent analysis on. And and I, I think you know I'll, I'll give one example of a CERT product, and just so you can characterize kind of see what we're dealing what um, is involved like we have a whole set of, of analyses for aborts right we did one pad abort test to sort of anchor uh, the analysis uh, and that was at the white sands missile range back in November of 2019 we're not we now take the data from that test the data from all the testing of the thrusters and the GNC system and we go do an analysis of all the abort modes uh, across uh, Starliner, and then we, we go run the independent analysis on the NASA side and go close that out. So that's one example of the kind of work we're doing here toward the end of April or end of February and then into March. And so we'll just have to see how each one of those goes, and then we'll have a sense, I think, um, in a few weeks of where that is, and then we can make a decision relative to should we load propellant and then what launch date's achievable. So. And our next question will be Eric Berger at Ars Technica. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. And, and I'm going to request or, or respect Jeff's, you know, request to keep the call focused on Starliner. But it is it is disappointing that six days after the Soyuz MS-21 issue, we haven't really had a substantial response from NASA or been able to talk to anyone about the the issues related to that. Um, on on the Starliner mission, is there going to be any demonstration? of Starliner's reboost capabilities for ISS. Um, that could become a valuable you know, asset with this vehicle. And I'm just wondering, is this strictly a test of the vehicle, you know, getting crew tuned from the station, or are you building in, you know, additional objectives into the mission? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'll take that one, see if Mark has anything to add. Um, that, uh, great question. The, the, the mission, the crude flight test, is really a, um, a demonstration of the ability to take crew and cargo uh, to the space station dock successfully. We'll have some checkouts while we're docked uh, of things like, you know, we have a requirement for what we call safe haven. So if the crew needs to get in uh, Starliner, the, the space station crew needs to get in Starliner for a period of time. Uh, we use Starliner's consumables to keep keep the crew safe in that time frame where they would have to. So we'll test test that out. We'll test some of the habitability uh, while we're docked to the space station. Obviously, uh, docked audio communications and things like that. But we we really don't have a, any kind of reboost capability plan or a test of the reboost capability at all of Starliner. So. I have nothing else to add to that, Steve. You covered it. And our next question is from Jeff South at Space News. Uh, good morning. Um, is the uh, question probably either for Steve or Mark? Is the 60-day uh, time frame between um, fueling Starliner and launch is that a mitigation to prevent corrosion to valves that was? Seen earlier, or is that you know some other requirement uh, for the vehicle? Thanks. I can jump in, Stephen, if you'd like to add. It, it is as a result of the uh, problem that we had uh, with the valve sticking. Um, we we are mu much more confident today with the uh, with the mitigation that we've put in place with the purge systems and the sailing of the connectors so that we don't get that kind of moisture intrusion into the valve. Uh, but we still have that 60-day uh, guideline, I guess I'll call it, uh, and I've asked our engineering to go back and look at that to make sure that, that's, that we're comfortable with that in case we had to go longer. And I don't have anything to add. 
And our next question will be from Marcia Dunn at the Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. Um, thanks. Uh, for Steve or Jeff, now that there have been two leaking Russian spacecraft, I'm wondering whether the Starliner will carry extra seats to potentially bring back station crew in an emergency. Same question goes for the SpaceX Crew Dragon that it's about to launch. Will it carry up extra seats to play it safe? Thanks. Yeah, Mar Marsha, you were uh, pretty soft, but let me make sure I understood the question. I think the question was, would Starliner carry extra seats? And then would we have any extra seats on the uh, Crew 6 Dragon? And, and I would say uh, right now there's no plans to add any additional seats to Starliner. Um, you know, it's really a test flight, just like uh, the Demo 2 test flight. We flew two crew members on that flight. Uh, Doug, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin were doing the same thing. Again, it's a test flight, testing the capability. And then uh, with the Dragon that we are configured to launch, we have the four seats nominally, um, and, and that's all we have. Um, we have the contingency capability that we talked about a little bit available um, for that Dragon as well, but, but uh, that we, didn't, we just don't have the ability to add extra seats at this time. Yeah, and I don't have anything to add to that. Our next question will be from Chris Gephardt at NASA Space Flight. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is for Steve and Mark. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you aren't off the ground by the end of the April window, um, so, sort of how, how does that overall sequence with ULA's operations and the ISS in terms of when your next opportunity might be and in terms of Starliner, would, would that mean having to take it back to the C-3PF to have its propellant re reserviced or, or anything like that if you do miss the April window? Thank you. I can talk a little bit. We've been in really close dialogue with uh, ULA. You know, they have an important milestone that they'd like to achieve as well in the same time frame, which adds to the complexity of our ISS traffic, and that is their testing and eventual launch of their Vulcan vehicle. So we've been in very close contact with them to make sure that as we go through this decision process, they're engaged and, and we're balancing, you know, the needs between what we need and what they need. So right now, we, we still feel that that mid-April to late-April time slot is good for us. It balances with the ULA priorities. If we do move into May, uh, we probably at the beginning of May, we're still okay. Uh, if we start slipping past that, then we'll, we'll have to have some pretty good discussions with ULA on, on who goes first. As far as going back to the C3PF, I think we'd need a really large slip in, in order for that to happen. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just address that if it happens. And Steve, if you have anything else to add. No, I think you address address the uh, complexity of the ULA manifest really well, and I would say, you know, just looking at the space station uh, and commercial crew manifest, you know, the priorities are obviously to get this uh, crew rotation completed, where we uh, launch crew six and dock crew six, and then return crew five. The next priority is to execute this uh, cargo mission uh, to resupply the space station. Um, and have some experiments for uh, the onboard crew to execute. And then following that, the next, uh, the next priority is really, um, and I've had a lot of conversations with Joel Montalbano, the station program managers, to go fly uh, the CFT crew flight demonstration. So we would make that window available. Should there be some delays or on either side, it, should we move in out of April into the May time frame, uh, we would have a window at ISS to go, to go fly. And our next question will be from Stephen Clark at Space Flight Now. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I think uh, Steve actually just addressed my question on, on priorities over the spring uh, time frame. But if I could, a uh, question for uh, Martin Nappy. Can you go through some of the top IFAs that you're still trying to close out from OFT2, just the status update on, on some of those big items? Yeah, there's really only one big item that we have not closed out, and it's planned on uh, being heard at the end of this month, beginning of March, and that is the uh, OMAC 
uh, failure that we had with the with the OMAX. Um, we we had a, a rationale. Remember, now we we don't get the service module back, so you know we can we we put together a very extensive fault tree to make sure that we went through every possible scenario, every possible fault that could have caused what we saw in flight. And since we don't get the hardware back, you know, we have to go to the most probable. And when we got down close to closing that fault tree, we recognized with NASA that we wanted to do a little bit of additional testing. So we ran that testing in in February. We've gotten that result back and we are working with NASA to make sure that we both agree that that that, that box in the fault tree can be closed. We'll bring that back to a board here in the beginning of March and, and make those decisions. But that's really the only significant one that we have left. We have a number of very small ones that um, they all have solutions. It's really just a matter of getting them to the board and getting them closed. And I would echo what Mark said. And, and we talked, I think we had sort of six that we sort of highlighted before when we talked, and five of those six are closed. And the one that's a little more a problematic is uh, the one that Mark talked about with the OMAC thrusters because, again, we don't get that service module back. And so, as he said, we had to do a little bit more testing uh, to convince ourselves that we had the, the failure mode right, and uh, we should work through that here in the March time frame and get that one behind us. One of the ones that we did close out that you, we're already sort of seeing um, the fruits of is, you know, we had the, the coolant loop um, uh, freeze up in the radiator, and you know, Mark and his team have worked uh, several modifications uh, to the vehicle to uh, improve the system, and also some improvement on the loading of that fluid, which is called Golden, which is underway uh, as the vehicle's in the hazardous processing area to get it ready for the integrated testing. And so that there's a drying system that dries out that coolant, and then uh, some improvements to make sure that we don't have that same problem. And so. It's sort of evidence to me of uh, us working together as a team, uh, making improvements to the vehicle. Uh, there's numerous improvements to the flight software uh, as well on some of the other um, IFAs uh, that we saw in flight, and we've made those and tested those in the um, uh, hardware software simulated lab that we call ASIL, and, uh, and those have checked out well. And our next question is from Irene Klotz at Aviation Link. Thanks very much. Um, for Jeff, the uh, departure of the uh, Progress 82, that's not changed at all. That had always been scheduled for today. And is there any possibility that the coolant link is, link is going to make that spacecraft uh, not controllable? And then um, for, Mar for, um, uh, for Mark, um, I think I just heard you say that the, you're targeting the um, post-certification mission one for winter of 24. Um, is that, I presume that's dependent on a launch of the um, orbital, of the crew flight test in April, and that's about, you need about six, seven months. Is that what you're basically planning on between the two flights? So I guess I'll take the first part of that. Um, so you are correct, Irene. Um, the, uh, the departure for the progress has been on the books. Uh, at least I went back and looked at my notes since about December 30th. And um, so that is that has been the date. Uh, so the coolant leak um, has to do with cooling the, the avionics in the, in the vehicle. Uh, we've done some assessments. Our, the Russian, our Russian colleagues have done assessments of, of how long they can operate that vehicle without cooling, and uh, we're well within limits. So we think all of the avionics will operate as planned, and, and there has been no impact to the propulsion system at all. So um, we're very confident that uh, the control of the vehicle will be, will be nominal. As far as the second part of that question, uh, there are some dependencies on CFT, uh, so, but, there, but most of the work that has to be done is not dependent on CFT. The, the vehicle, the, the service module is being built right now. The crew module is a separate crew module, so it's in refurbishment. So those two have a plan 
to be ready for next uh, beginning of 24. Flight software, we understand what needs to be done there with the full port capability, and then we have a number of things that we want to put into our flight software for PCM. That is all in work, and we understand that. Uh, what might pop out of CFT uh, could be some learning that takes place on CFT that we want to add a few things, but we've put a placeholder in our software update process to absorb those. So flight software is in good shape. Uh, mission operations is pretty template type stuff, so again, not dependent on CFT. The certification process is what has a few dependencies. We want some data off of the CFT mission in order to conduct our certification process, and we intend to get that done uh, before the end of the year. So, uh, to to you know specifically to answer your question, there's a great deal of things that are very independent of CFT and CFT can move a little bit more to the right and we'd still be able to support the, the mission in the, in the, the, uh, wrote the first rotation of 2024. Thank you. And our next question is from Richard Trebeau at the Orlando Sentinel. Hi, yes, thanks for taking my question. Um, regarding the future, uh, the six contracted uh, Starliner missions, um, it said you were, targeting winter of 24 for the first rotational mission. Does that mean you're uh, basically set for the, the second mission of each uh, calendar year? Is that sort of the plan? Uh, and is there any, you're out of Atlas rockets after that point for rides. Is there, um, I think previously you said you were looking at contingencies to potentially use Vulcan. Uh, any, any progress on that? Thanks. Okay, so we um, we are planning for one flight a year. Uh, currently, we're we're getting ready for to be available to NASA uh, in that first rotation, and then we're planning one flight a year after that. And of course, NASA needs us more often than that. We are posturing to be ready to go more frequently. Uh, we are also looking at post PCM six or post those six flights when. We run out of atlases. What what is the next launch vehicle we want to go to, and what other changes do we want to make in order to support the market that we see growing with low Earth orbit? Uh, so we have been in discussions with other launch vehicle providers. We're working with Steve uh, on with those discussions to make sure we're in lockstep with NASA and and the and not just the launch vehicle integration for the new launch vehicle, but also for some of the changes that we want to make on our vehicle. So th that is a, a, a very active pro project that is uh, that we're working on, and, and we intend to be ready when we are done with PCM-6 to move on to the next, I guess, the next stage of life for Starliner. I think Mark said it really well. I mean, when we talk about sort of rotation slots, there's the early slot, which is the one we're about to uh, have the crew uh, six, crew five, handover uh, rotation for this year and so Mark's talking about that that same time frame next year is the first PCM uh, one flight Starliner one which we're excited about as well and we have been working with Mark on uh, long-term plans uh, beyond PCM six uh, once the last Atlas has been flown out and our next question is from Mikey Maidenberg at the Wall Street Journal Hey there, Steve uh, and Jeff. Um, at the ASAP, PD, ASAP panel meeting last week, there was a discussion of a different perception of risk between the commercial crew office and the ISS office about Starliner-related risk. Could, could you each talk about what that debate or, or disagreement is about? Um, I'm wondering if it covers the OMAC thrusters that, that were discussed earlier. Thanks. Let me try to take that one. Uh, um, yeah, the, the, the ASAP's comments relative to different levels of risk. Uh, first of all, uh, we in commercial crew and ISS program have two different risk systems, and I think sometimes it, we do a we don't explain it very clearly why. So if I step back and look at our vehicles and the risk for um, launching crews and docking to the space station and then undocking and reentering, 
a lot of our risk are really in that uh, phases of, of launch um, and landing, right? I mean, the, par the parachute system is, is a relatively high-risk system, as you might imagine, uh, when you start to do, uh, separate, uh, in Starliner's case, a forward heat shield, deploy two drogue parachutes, um, then have three pilot chutes pull out the mains, and that all has to sequence very carefully relative to the landing event, and the, the heat shield drops off and the airbags deploy. And so quite a bit of risk relative to, to that kind of operation with pyrotechnics, parachutes, propulsion systems, and so forth. So when I when I look at my risks for our vehicles, I mean some of those kind of things will be to the top: separation systems, prop uh, propulsion systems, parachutes, landing airbags, and those sorts of things. ISS, the, when the vehicle arrives, uh, other than um, the time frame when it's approaching ISS and docking, largely the vehicle is fairly quiescent, and and so there's not uh, the, the level of risk is different and. And so, you know, one of the risks that we've been talking a little bit about is, is um, uh, the battery system on Starliner and what the risk of that is. And we, we would rank it one way in our system, and ISS would see it as a bit of a higher risk relative to the kinds of things that they're worried about. Like, uh, for example, on ISS, the, the highest risks are kind of micrometeoroid impacts. Same really for our vehicles as well. And then after that, the batteries would raise to kind of a higher level of risk. But for, for the commercial crew program and for Mark, you know, we would have higher risk like the pyrotechnic separation systems, the parachute systems, the propulsion systems, the abort systems, those sorts of things would be higher risk in our. So that, that's what ASAP was talking about. And I, we'll, we'll have to circle back with them and try to explain this a little bit better. And, and hopefully what I uh, gave as an explanation was, was a little, little bit uh, try to explain exactly what the differences are. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add, uh, first of all, I totally agree with what Steve just said. Um, we work lockstep with the cargo, the, the CCP office, and uh, their requirement set, and it's very comparable to our requirement set. The way we certify a vehicle to come and go is very comparable to the way they do it. Um, we've analyzed them coming and going. We've analyzed them being on station. We've worked the procedures. We've updated we have OCADs, we have all kinds of things, all kinds of products in place, but from our perspective, I, I would treat both of the crewed vehicles, we're talking about U.S. crewed vehicles as, as equal from a, from a risk balance trade point of view, and, and uh, we're, we're very excited to see them show up. I'll, I'll say that again, because that's, that's kind of how it, that's kind of what it comes down to. And our next question will be from Manuel Mazzotti from Exploration Especial. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, would you mind describing what kind of cargo it's on board the capsule? And if it's mainly provisions or science or any particular hardware? Um, and if you're, what kind of uh, cargo as well are you planning to bring back with uh, taking advantage of this uh, first crew flight test? Thank you. I guess I'll attempt to take a look at that or, or add to that. I would say it's a combination of all of those things. Um, we have a little bit more capacity on this vehicle since we're only flying two crew, and maybe Mark can help me a little bit there. Um, you know, one of the things we try to get back on a regular basis is NORS tanks, uh, and I, I can't remember if we're bringing one back on, on this particular flight, but it's a, a fairly large item. It's one of our high-pressure tanks that we use to get oxygen and nitrogen uh, to ISS. And, um, but I'd, have to, I'd have to, probably have to take a note on that one and get back to you with a, with a better answer, I think. And I, I don't have a, a super good uh, list right now in front of me of what the cargo is. I'm sure we're taking some supplies to ISS and some science, and then there, obviously there's um, the normal kinds of things that uh, the Starliner crew needs on their uh, trip from the launch pad to the space station, you know, uh, food, water, um, and various clothing and supplies like that. So, But, but I, I don't know how the details. And I'm, I'm in the same boat. Uh, we were, you know, now just getting ready to pack all the cargo bags and 
we have those lists in our engineering, so we can certainly get that and, and uh, get it uh, get it out to y'all. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask the question, please press star one on your phone to enter the queue. And our next question will be from David Curley at Discovery. Thanks, Josh. Uh, a question for Mark. Uh, Steve mentioned a couple of the changes you mentioned in your opening remarks that uh, you learned about some hardware changes. Can you give us a couple more specifics? And, and on the parachutes, what exactly are you doing with the chute rebuild? Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, uh, as we went through the, the flow uh, with both building the, the service module and refurbishing the crew module, you know, we do a great deal of testing. And during that testing, sometimes we get black boxes or the hardware doesn't quite work like we want it to, maybe a sticky valve. And, and so we've, we discovered a few of those things uh, as we were going through the processing of the vehicle and we, we addressed them. We replaced uh, one valve that had a, a, a sticky um, poppet in it. And um, there were just a, a, a number of those you know, little things that, that had to be addressed along the way. Uh, as far as the, the big things that we wanted to go do, uh, and they really are related to, to PCM, is with the parachute mod, and, and we mentioned we wanted to uh, increase, you know, the reliability of our batteries by putting some barriers in between them. Uh, the engineering team's off working those options right now, and uh, we expect to have those uh, that design complete, and so we can go ahead and, and incorporate that for the PCM mission. And then on the parachutes, uh, we um, we really are just looking at, and Steve could probably talk in a lot more detail on this, but we're looking at really beefing up the, the sturdiness of the lines that we use on our main parachutes. Uh, we've got material coming in here, uh, see, next month, and we'll start building uh, three new chutes or four new chutes that will be an enhancement over the, the chutes that we currently fly. Uh, you know, these, these will, will uh, give us you know, more capability on these chutes for you know, more, um, more, more robust, I should say, capability on these chutes for, for hardier conditions that we can land in. And we expect to have those chutes ready for us by the end of the summer, uh, looking like we're going to do some kind of drop test to, to verify that that system works like it's supposed to, and then, again, be ready for the, the February time frame. And I'll just add Steve, one thing on the chutes. It, this is a relatively minor modification. It's it's not a uh, a large redesign. And this is on the the main canopies, the three uh, main canopies that's used to to slow the Starliner down for um, its final descent uh, and landing on the airbag system. Um, it's really to strengthen the joint, like like Mark said, as the there's 80 suspension lines that kind of hold the attached to the parachute and kind of come down and attach to something called a riser. And there's just one, uh, j what's called a joint, that basically attaches that suspension line to the main canopy, and it's going to get strengthened a little bit, and we'll test it to make sure it's good to go fly. Is this different than what SpaceX did with their changes to their chutes? Yeah, yeah, I should address that. Thank you for that question. Um, for SpaceX, we had... I would say a major redesign of the parachute system, and this is going back a number of years between the, the demo demonstration one flight, which was the uncrewed flight, and the crewed flight test, uh, or uh, the demo two flight, which was the crewed flight test. You know, we did a major redesign to that that parachute system to, to strengthen many areas of the canopy um, and to change the way that it inflated. Um, and it was a major uh, redesign that required a number of uh, tests to get that design iterated upon and then a number of final uh, drop tests of that configuration. This is, this is by no means that kind of redesign. This is really not changing the, the performance of the system at all. It's really just think about it as, you know, in a mechanical system, it would be like putting a stronger bolt in a mechanical system. 
in this textile system, it's just making this one join a little stronger. And we just want to make sure with one uh, parachute drop test that we haven't changed any of the other properties, but the, but the team feels really, really confident about it. Thank you. I think I would add, um, Steve, that you know these these are the kind of changes that we will probably see through the life of the program. You know, our both Steve and I's experience on on space shuttle that we were making modifications throughout the life of the program as we learned more about our systems, as we got uh, you know better materials, et cetera. You know, these changes were just smart to go do, and and we'll we'll revisit these. You know, every mission, and then we'll plan them in for the for the proper flight. And our next question is from Chris Gephardt at NASA Space Flight. Uh, yeah, I, I'm wondering too on on this. Uh, could you also walk me through a little bit of uh, the the software here? I, I know you said there's some minor changes to the software, so I'm just curious. Um, you know, how, how many end-to-end -end tests were done with the software that's going to fly on CFT, and uh, are, are those runs complete, or do you still have some more software testing ahead of you? Yeah, I wouldn't begin to, to guess a number. There's a, you know, the, developing software is a very iterative process, as most of you know. Uh, so we go through that iterative process to, to develop the software. It's all tested a, a number of times. And then we go into um, failure mode testing with, with the team and the mission ops team, with our flight software team and the crew. And we intentionally fail a number of different systems to see how everything reacts. Uh, we also do just normal end-to-end -end mission type of training to where we exercise the crew the, the team and the software uh, so that we can validate that everything's working like it's supposed to. And so it serves as, you know, checking the software and it serves as, as, a, as a practice session for the team. Uh, again, I'm not going to guess on how many times that, that this, this software gets tested, but it is very extensive. And, what you know, we're getting to, again getting to the point where we've gotten through all these tests. We're looking at the data. We may want to run one or two more failure scenarios to get even more comfortable. And the, the software teams between um, Boeing and NASA are looking at that data now to see if we want to run those tests. And we've made uh, we've made a hole so that we can go do it. But that's about all that's left with uh, with the flight software for CFT. Now, PCM, what we do is we go through the number of PRs or problem reports that we've documented, the changes that we want to make with this dual port, and then we'll look at how many things that the mission, op teams, mission ops team do today do we want to retire and incorporate into our software. That process is all taking place now so that we can determine what goes in that last revision of software that will be happening uh, in the middle of the summer. And our next question is from Michael Sheets at CNBC. Hi, everyone. Uh, this question is for Mark. Uh, on the uh, Aerojet rocket down valves uh, that had the corrosion issue two years ago, I'm, I'm curious, uh, we talked a little bit last year about both short-term mitigations as well as long-term redesigns that were under consideration. What's the latest on uh, what the short-term mitigations were that have given you confidence to move forward with this salt applied test, as well as uh, any considerations and discussions on, uh, or even just work already on redesigning the valves for the rest of the, uh, the future six crew missions? Thanks. Yes. Uh, so on the short-term mitigation, of course, we, we implemented that short-term short mitigation for OFT2. It worked really nicely. We're doing an enhanced version of that uh, for CFT. And that what I mean by enhanced is that we're just, instead of putting the, the enclosures in after the fact, after the vehicle's built, we're putting these enclosures in as the vehicle's getting built. So it just makes it uh, even more robust uh, to make sure that the environment around those valves doesn't contain any moisture. 
So we're pretty confident with that uh, that process. It's all complete. It's all behind us, and we've been testing it, and it's working great. Uh, as far as the long-term solution, we have a redesign. We have been working with the supplier. Uh, those design reviews are in process. They're actually building hardware, and we would like to get that targeted uh, in to the, the earliest mission possible. It's questionable whether we can get it there for PCM1. Definitely we'll get it there for PCM2. We're not going to give up on one, uh, and if we don't get it in on one, we'll use that short-term mitigation one more time. And our final question for today will be Joe Roulette at Reuters. Thanks. A uh, quick question for Mark or, or maybe uh, Steve wants to answer. What are SMART initiators? Uh, thanks. Steve, uh, I, I could take a crack at that. Um, so uh, let's see how to describe this. Most uh, pyrotechnic systems are relatively simple in that um, you send a, a command from the flight computer to that pyrotechnic system, and then there's something called a NASA standard initiator, and then it initiates the that pyrotechnic burn uh, to to do that separation function, whether it be a bolt or a SEP system. Uh, Boeing has some, implemented something called a smart initiator, which has a delay time in it. So um, it can stagger when it gets the command, it can stagger uh, when that uh, pyrotechnic device fires. And, and they do that because when they um, go to separate the crew module from the, the service module, they need a kind of a staggered timeline, and that command gets sent uh, across the umbilical, then the umbilical gets cut, and then the service model needs to separate on its own. And so that, that smart initiator really is just a way to have what I would call a delay time in um, for that uh, pyrotechnic separation. So hopefully I answered your question. So. Yep, thanks. Thank you to our speakers and for the media on the line today. That's going to wrap things up for us here. We'll have more to come on this important flight test, so follow us online and on social media. And you can learn more about this mission at nasa.gov forward slash commercial crew. Have a good day. Thank you.